So uh, I came to LXGS last year, and I saw Max's um, database JavaScript talk, and I was like, oh, that, that's, a, that's a cute idea. Um, didn't, didn't realize that my destiny would be to build um, databases in JavaScript, and I certainly didn't expect that uh, a year on I would be answering questions like people would ask me, um, um, so we have this modular database. People ask me, oh, that's great, but can leveled UB scale? And the answer is, of course it can. It's a, it's a modular um, ecosystem, so just write some modules that implement your own scalable architecture. Um, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> so um, the question that you should ask is, what does scalable mean anyway? Um, we've kind of been trained, like, the last uh, couple of years to ask, like, by, like, <clears throat> MongoDB, um, is it, does it scale? And um, it's not really that simple. Um, first of all, the, it's definitely important to point out that scalability is not the same idea as performance. Um, scalability is about how your performance changes as the size of the data or the size of your application or the number of users um, you have connected to it, um, as that increases, um, to be scalable it means that we need to be able to increase the, um, the size while keeping the, the performance um, relatively constant or at least within affordable, um, within acceptable bounds. So, um, so something scalable if it's, if it's if it's good properties like low latency are preserved while the overall size changes. Ideally, performance should stay flat. Um, but if you do things really badly, um, you can make something that doesn't scale to even just a few users. Um, I've seen things that do this. I'm not talking about Ruby on Rails. I'm talking about um, various, various actual systems that, not in Node, but that in previous life that people have um, been running in production um, and people were paying for that were just horribly painful um, to use. They were just like just barely uh, working well enough. And I'm not going to name any names, but that sort of stuff. Ask me, ask me in the hallway about um, some more stories for that. But if you are stupid enough, um, you can make things that just work terribly. Um, so basically, you've got a few resources like um, you've got network I/O, disk-based CPU. And you've only got so much, there's only so much a single computer can do. And you've got to do as much of that as you can. Um, and then if you, if you can't do what you need to do in that amount of resources, you need to somehow spread it over multiple machines. And then things start to get complicated, not least because you have this durability problem. Like sometimes computers crash, sometimes hardware breaks. That's, that's a lot less likely. Um, and unless you have hundreds or thousands of machines running at once. Um, but the most common thing really is just networks going down. Sometimes the connection will drop, um, and then you need to be able to resume any um, connections or process you were doing over the network and um, do that in a, in a straightforward way. So there's basically two, two approaches to, rep to um, to scaling. There's replication and there's sharding. Um, so replication is just taking a duplicate of your Node.js pizza and like creating multiple of them. So uh, each one does the same thing. You've just copied it to another state. So then you can proxy connections to um, each pizza and um, each individual thing uses less um, network I.O. and CPU. This one, of course, has the entire copy of the database. So they'll need um, all of the, so it won't conserve disk space. Um, alternative is you go pizza by the slice, and you break up your application into sections and put them on different machines. And then this works. Um, this is what you want when um, your data set gets so large that it can't fit on a single machine anymore. Um, so the harder part is replication. Um, um, for, a, for a number of reasons, but um, this is the, the basic anatomy of how replication works. Is first, you um, two computers connect, and then they have to first figure out what the difference from one data set and the other data set is. Um, 
and then they send missing history. They just get each other up to sync. And then after that, optionally, they can do like real-time replication and just keep each one continuously up to date as long as they, they are connected. Um, and the handshake is essential because even if, even if you started them both at, at, at the first time you turned them on, they were connected, at some point they're going to come disconnected and they'll need to reconnect again. And it's simpler to make everything be able to resume than to have to start over from scratch. So this is a simple uh, diagram of perhaps the, of the simplest form of um, replication, where you just go one way. So the master, this is, this is how MongoDB works. So you have a master, you have a master database, um, and you send all the writes to that database, and then the output of that streams uh, updates to the slave databases, and then you can just proxy the reads between all the slave databases, and they will all be, um, they'll have the data sets but um, to make sure that any logic uh, regarding like things you have to do when you update things and like checking that, um, say if, you, if you're doing a conditional set, you have to check that something is true before you update the thing or don't update it twice or don't delete things, given user permissions or something like that. You can handle that all on the master DB and then you copy that down to the slave DBs. Um, and then, so basically each write is logs. There's a little bit of overhead here, um, and there usually there always is with um, with um, replicating or sharding um, or just paralyzing. There's a little bit of extra housekeeping you have to do to make sure everything stays sane. And so with master slave, every um, every write is logged with a sequence number, and then um, using the atomic batch thing that um, that Rod showed you, and then slaves connect and request the update since the last since the request updates since the latest that they know, and then the master will send them those updates. And then you can use, um, there's more. So, um, then Scuttlebutt is a more interesting protocol than this, where it works with peer-to-peer. -peer. And Scuttlebutt is actually a technical term. Um, it's the nautical word for, uh, it's a nautical slang for gossip but it's the name of an algorithm that I got from a scientific paper so, um, by, by Amazon, and it's used in Amazon DB. Um, and it's, it's kind of like the, um, the master-slave thing, but, every, um, but the sequence IDs are tracked per node that originated that update. Uh, and then you can um, do a thing. And there's a module called Scuttlebutt, which I wrote, that um, you can read the code and see how that works and just in memory representation. And it's quite simple. And then there's this other one that I've gotten to recently, which is uh, called Merkle Trees. And this is a really interesting approach where um, all of the objects in your database are, are hashed. So a hash gives you a one-way function that takes any like, arbitrary data and turns it into a representation of that data, which can only go one way. Given the, the same data, you can confirm that that was the hash, but the chance of generating another hash that, um, that has different data is so astronomically slow, uh, so astronomically low that basically at the moment, you might be able to do it, but it would, you'd be spending millions of dollars of compute time to generate another object that hashed the same. For the simplest hashes and for the most complicated ones, it would just be like not even, not even possible. Don't even think about it. Um, so a Merkle, Merkle tree um, um, basically ha hashes each object and then it hashes groups of the hashes into a, into a tree and then the, the groups of those hashes into, until you get to a final hash and then you compare two trees and you check the top hash, and if they're the same, then you're done. And if they're not, then you check the next layer and the next layer until you can, so you can efficiently figure out the difference um, or the union between two very large sets, um, even without sending much data over the network thing. So you can figure out what the difference is and then you can just send the um, subsets um, that are differed. And um, DynamoDB, um, DynamoDB uses this as well. Oh, and um, interesting to note that uh, last night I met uh, a guy, uh, Romito, who, um, as his end-of-year project and his undergraduate degree, he is implementing um, uh, DynamoDB on top of LevelDB and in Node.js. So um, now that I know that, um, he, he won't be able to um, sleep at night without publishing everything he's doing, so we'll better all use that. Um, so this is just what code for, just to show that replication is easy, this is what the code looks like. 
Um, so you just create a server, gives you a stream, and all of the um, all of the replicator, all the replicators just have a create stream method, and you pipe it through the stream. And then there's a client that looks like pretty much the same, except it makes it, it calls the phone rather than answers it. Um, all of the replication schemes look like that, and it's easy to use in any context that has streams. So the important thing, though, the thing that you've really got to understand about replication is it only works if your data suits replication. Um, so it doesn't really work for relational databases or complex graph stuff. Um, the best way, though highly recommended, if you represent your objects as append-only updates, so instead of having a single document that you change, have a series of documents that you update, that you, you, you add another one to the series, and then you take the series together and you combine them, and that gives you the value that you want. And that is really easy to merge and to replicate. Um, so basically make everything immutable um, and smaller, um, which LevelDB is really good at because it's good at sequences. Um, so sharding has similar, has similar properties. Um, basically, you, you need to have a large data set um, where the objects don't have relations to each other, uh, that are any like, important relations. So for example, um, say products on Amazon have relations to each other because they're like, um, people who bought this also bought that. Um, but then, um, but say a user's uh, shopping cart is just, it's just that user's shopping cart and there's no other extra information that it's attached to. Um, so yeah, so either like large sets of homogenous data or you could also have smaller sh sets of data that you can consider to be one um, changing, one rapidly changing document by having appends, that, like a chat room. That works really well too. Um, the other really important thing to understand is like how does the data, how does the data change? For example, um, you have some things that are like templates, for example, um, they're pretty much hard-coded into your app. So there's always only going to be less than like a fixed number of things. Sometimes you have slowly changing things where like um, people add products or like a user signs up and there's quite a bit of work to getting each one of those pieces of data. So that data doesn't change that fast. But then you have things like user-created data that happens, that changes a great deal. Um, and then there's sort of relationships between um, data. And so one thing here that's very important is, for example, if you've got some sort of graph feature, uh, like say Twitter, um, you have followers, and that's a graph. And some people with graphs, consistently you find situations where um, there are some super nodes that have many connections, like the Dalai Lama or Justin Bieber, they have millions of followers. And when they, when they tweet, it has to go to everyone. Um, then with things like global, um, global trends, that's so kind of simple. That's just funneling data in. So the, 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 um, when, when you can have very big um, relations, and you probably, you probably want to handle that differently. So those are, those are like the standard ideas about scaling. And I've also got a few more radical ones. Um, when, with Node.js, one of the dreams of Node.js is that it's the same, it's one language to rule them all. And we have LevelDB running on the browser as well. We have replication. So why not just replicate the data to the clients instead of, um, instead of buying a whole bunch of computers in the data center, let's just use the computers that our users have. Um, and when you've got things like um, uh, WebRTC, um, the users can just communicate uh, together, and there's a few interesting things heading in this direction. Um, for example, this thing, PeerCDN, which is basically, um, a, it's like BitTorrent for the images and that sort of stuff on your, um, on your page, and it, when people go to your page, it can be served from um, other users that are viewing that page. Um, this is definitely one of the first things we've seen in this, in this area, but there's a lot of room for mad science. Um, in this, um, in this area. Um, and there's this one I'm working on, 
um, which I'm calling uh, Cypherlinx or Cypher.net, um, which is it's a content addressable data set, which is just like you have content addressable data like in Git, and then you replicate with Merkle trees, and then you just index everything, and you query um, you query by searching, and you just build with serverless peer-to-peer -peer applications. So um, storing a, a key is you you hash the document and then use that as the key, and that's a pretty awful key. Um, it's not the name of the document or anything like that, so it's going to be hard to get out. But what you just do is you just index all of the things and the um, all of the properties, and then you query it by searching. So, for example, um, instead of having to write a MapReduce or something complicated, we'll just search for um, documents that have this path. So, whether dependent, with Optimist, with an Optimist field inside the dependencies field, and say if this was the NPM data set, we would just get all of the modules, all of the like 1,200 modules. Um, or 12,000 or whatever it is that depend on Optimist. And that was two lines of code. So that's a really good way of um, working with data anyway, and it works and it makes the keys as, the hashes as keys are tolerable. And then, so, but then since we're indexing everything, what if we index um, thing, we come index property and then we see that it's a, it looks like a hash. Now we can assume that that must be the hash of something, perhaps another document that's also in the database. So we can interpret that as a link, but not like a hyperlink, it's a cipher link, which links, it's kind of like the reverse of a hyperlink, where a hyperlink tells you where to get a thing, uh, a cipher link tells you what the thing is. Um, so you'll know it when you see it. Um, and presumably the person who gave you the data, the document that had the link in it will know where to get that thing, or there are a variety of ways you could um, um, index that sort of thing that could be interesting. Um, and then you can also replicate arbitrary subsets by like making some query that, that, that selects some set of like our mutual followers, for example, and then we can replicate them. And basically this will allow us to build um, peer-to-peer -peer applications where it's kind of like um, you know, like you check, you do, a, you clone with Git, and then you work on the thing, and you've got your own complete copy, and you can push changes back. When you go to a web page, you could check out the web page, you could make your own changes, and then you could push it back, or to anyone else, and you could have completely um, peer-to-peer -peer applications. And this is this is my new mad science project. So hopefully, um, in a year, I'll be telling you about uh, um, how this goes, because um, that's the end. Thanks very much. <laughs>